Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello, and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir, and joining me as always is my co-host, Austin Davidson. Hello. It's season three, episode 59 and today we're going to do things a little differently. The Steelers' 24-21 to 21 loss to the Oakland Raiders. Oh, man, it can be described in a lot of different ways, Austin. And I think instead of doing what we had been doing the last few weeks, where we go through the game relatively detailed analysis, I think instead we're just going to do kind of maybe like a quick overview. And more importantly, we're just going to talk about big picture things. Uh we I think we were texting about about this game beforehand, just a, like an hour before kickoff, because the Raiders made their best offensive and defensive lineman inactive for this game, and we said that the Steelers we'd be mad if the Steelers won by what was it less than like ten points, something like that, yeah. <laughs> and if they lost, it would be ridiculous. And well, they lost, and. We'll get into it, but it was one of the ugliest games I think I've ever seen the Steelers play. Um, let's talk about some of the worst losses in the Mike Tomlin era. I mean, there's there's a lot of bad losses, and I guess we need to break up losses into two different categories here. There are losses to good teams in big games, and then there are losses to bad bad teams in games that aren't cons- that are important per se, but you're not considering it a big game. So I guess. In the first category, I was thinking, Austin, the worst games of the Mike Tomlin era, you could talk about the Chargers loss two weeks ago. You could talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars loss. You can talk about hmm, maybe the the playoff loss to uh, Tim Tebow and the Broncos. Um, Those are some of the games I'm thinking of there. Uh, um, Were you in line with my my, uh, thoughts there on that type of game? Yeah, this game definitely falls in line with those. And, like, another one I think of uh, is the Ryan Mallett uh, Ravens game where backup Ryan Mallett led the uh, already failing Ravens team that was riddled with injuries to a victory over the Steelers. That was definitely a bad one. But this one definitely can be considered in this category, I believe. And then, you know, other losses to bad teams on the road, like the Jets in 2014. Uh, there, there, There's a handful of them, too. I'm... Oh, the Buccaneers, Bears last year. the Bears last year, the Buccaneers in 2014 in Pittsburgh, the previous two Raiders games in Oakland. Um, if you want to go really far back, the Jets, who were won like four games in 2007, losing that game in overtime has to be up there. Uh, there's really, th- this one hurts because the Raiders, I think, are universally thought of as one of, if not the worst team in football. And the Steelers played their worst game of the season by far. And it's not like it wasn't an important game. This was a very important game. And now the Steelers theoretically could miss out on the playoffs. They're still a game ahead, of, a half game ahead of Baltimore. But they've lost their chance at a first round bye. They've almost, yeah, they've definitely lost a chance realistically at the number three seed. So it's basically the fourth seed or bust. And they've got a very difficult schedule going up. This was a very inopportune time to lose a game that they absolutely had chances to win. It really is. It, uh, again, right, I tweeted it, and I think I said it, but to ideally if the Steelers wanted a chance at even making the playoffs, they needed to go 2-2 two and two following that loss to the Chargers. And this is all, already a very, a very bad start because now the Ravens, they, I thought the Ravens were going to edge out the Chiefs. The Ravens took the Chiefs into overtime. And just bet on life. But now they're going to face the Buccaneers at home. They go into Chargers, so basically they're playing another home game because the Chargers don't have a home field. And then they play at home versus the Browns. And I'm looking at this, and the Browns are the only team that I think are going to challenge them. I think they're a way better team than the Chargers. And so right now the Steelers have screwed themselves when they're going uh, to play the Patriots and then the Saints and then the Bengals. The Bengals... Uh, they might be a really depleted team, but I literally just brought it up. The Steelers managed to lose to a Ryan Mallett injury riddled Ravens team. So how it, it wouldn't be I wouldn't put it past them to lose to a Jeff Driscoll 
injury riddled Bengals team. It, it wouldn't. I really wouldn't uh, put it past the Steelers to make it past that. So the Steelers are definitely not in a good spot right now. Like I, a lot of people are talking about the playoffs, and I'm struggling to see them making it at this point. They have to be very. Impre- I mean, at this point, who even wants to see them make it? They look like a one and done team. Like they, they, they might not even make it past there, but. Really, the Steelers need to pick up two wins and hope that they make it. That, 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 that's basically it because two wins, I, I think that the Ravens are winning out. And realistically, I think the Ravens are winning out. And that, with two wins, uh, that would mean the Ravens would finish as the, the AFC North champion. And then you, go, you have to look at the wild card, and the wild card teams for the, uh, uh, for the uh, rest of the AFC – they're just, they're all like seven and six. They're all right there with the Steelers. They're all a half game back. So, like, there's no guarantee that the Steelers even make it even as a wild card team because you have the Colts who are seven and six. You have the Titans who are seven and six. Uh, the Chargers already, the Chargers have them locked up. So there's no way the Chargers lose it unless they somehow beat the Chiefs Thursday night and then the Chiefs have it. But, uh, so, realistically, uh, oh, the Dolphins also seven and six. The Steelers are fighting all these teams that they're only a half game in front of, and it's just uh, it's not good. The Steelers are really in a very bad bad position by losing this really bad game. And you know, as, as funny as it is, Austin, what, do you, what I know we'd be surprised in the scope of what just happened, but knowing how the Steelers teams have been under Mike Tomlin, wouldn't it be? Just like almost like you almost kind of expect the Steelers, they almost like how would it be like if you go back and look like oh they lost to the Raiders but the next week they beat the Patriots couldn't you see that happening in a sense too? Yeah, no, that that, that can happen because I mean the Steelers did it early in the year. The Steelers uh, came in and beat up the Buccaneers after the Buccaneers started hot. I mean the Buccaneers are no no Patriots, but like Buccaneers are a very hot team, and right now. The Patriots are trending downward, so like, uh, it, it, I guess it could be looked at similar. And I mean, I don't, I don't see it happening if I'm being honest with you. But I mean, it would be very Steelers-like for them to just lose to the Raiders and then just turn around and beat the Patriots. So, I guess let's start getting into this game. And this game was a mess right from the first drive because the Raiders go right down the field and score. There's a lot of places we can go, but I think the most important thing or the most important or the biggest thing everyone was talking about was Ben Roethlisberger. And to kind of give you an overview, he took a sack late in the first half. He finished the half, but he was clearly in some discomfort. He goes in for some x-rays. He doesn't come out at halftime. He comes out sometime during the third quarter. Josh Jobs quarterbacks four drives, and Ben Roethlisberger finally comes back out on the drive after the Raiders take their uh, first go-ahead touchdown. So I believe at that point it was 17-14, to 14, if I'm not mistaken. And at that point, there are questions arising of would he have been able to go in earlier? He leads a touchdown drive, and then the Raiders lead a touchdown drive. And then, as we know, uh, the quick hook and ladder play to set up the Chris Boswell field goal attempt that ends up being a, a slip and a missed kick. So Mike Tomlin said after the game that Roethlisberger probably could have gone in the game a series or two sooner. Now that looks like just plain straight up ne- like negligence and just arrogance, almost assuming that Josh Dobbs, like we'd be okay to beat the Raiders with him in. But there's a little bit of reasoning for the madness. And I, I want to hear your thoughts on how much stock you take into it or how much of a big deal you think it is that the x-ray machines, they took x-rays of his ribs, but I should mention were so outdated that nobody knew if he had broken ribs or not. So you have a general idea because you have doctors there, but you don't truly know the extent of the injuries. So they cleared him, but we we know that Ryan Clark was cleared with a sickle cell anemia issue, uh, but after he had his gallbladder removed uh, after falling ill at a game in Denver, even though the doctors cleared him, he never played a game in Denver again. So... Is it possible that Tomlin was handling this in order to just keep him out of harm's way until the game was out of the uh, on the line, or do you think it was more of an arrogance kind of thing? I guess. What are your thoughts on this? Because at first I was very mad, but I kind of understand what he was doing now. 
Uh, I'm gonna have to say that first of all, that's ridiculous that the Raiders do not have like updated equipment in the stadium for uh, all the teams to use because that that's just it's negligence and it should be for a league that's looking for safety that is highly unsafe if you're not using the best things. The doctors ruled it inconclusive. Like, what if Ben did have a broken rib and just went back out there, got hit, and just really screwed him up? Maybe it caused internal bleeding because that's. That's the problem with broken ribs. Is it, it, if you break a rib, it could, it could go and stab you on the inside. So uh, that, that would have just been – obviously it didn't happen, but it would have been awful, and it would have been the Raiders' fault. It would have been the, that stadium, uh, the owner, uh, the owner's fault. But regardless, uh, going into the uh, the actual play and, like, the, uh, the Mike Tomlin, uh, what he called, it's just uh, – I don't think it's arrogance. I do think that he was looking out for his quarterback because they are going. They're going into a stretch here where you can argue that they they need to win and that they need to think about uh, their quarterback's health. Because if if you lose Ben Roethlisberger, we just saw what what it looks. Like. We had a flash of what it looks like without Ben Roethlisberger, and it does not look good. Uh, so I think that it wasn't arrogance, and he was just saying, "Okay, we will hold him out and only play him if we truly need to play him. Only if we're uh, we think that." This game needs uh, only if we think that we're going to lose this game, and so I guess that means that arrogance did play a little a, a little role into it because they're like we can roll with Josh Dobbs at least until we're losing, but I, I, I don't I feel like it was mostly to keep Ben uh, uh, healthy. What do you think? I agree with you. I definitely backed off kind of my original thoughts. My thoughts were kind of like if it was as it seemed and he was able to go back in, then you go back in. And I guess that he, they thought that he could, but, you know, you don't fully understand the nature of such an injury. And you remember back in 2012, he, he nearly pierced his aorta with a rib injury, right? Yeah, oh yeah. So, like, it, it, one very slight problem, and, you know, I can understand not wanting to take that risk until the game is on the line there. But, you know, it's just one of those weird things. The Steelers never should have had to be put in that position anyways. So, I don't know. I'm backing off kind of my original my original stance, which was this could be a fireable offense by Mike Tomlin. But it's still not good. It doesn't look like – it doesn't look good. The optics aren't great. But I get it. And I just – I wish he would say something like that instead of saying what he said at the press conference because he said – they were in a, in a quote-unquote flow of the game with Josh Dobbs, and that was the dumbest thing I've ever heard him say because in the four drives with Josh Dobbs, at quarterback, the Steelers went three and out, they turned it over on downs, they had an interception, and they punted. That's not a flow. That's terrible. So I just that's just my only wish is that he would have actually said what happened, and I get why he didn't, but I, I just wish he didn't say what he said. I have to agree with you. It was a uh, very not. Uh, it wasn't good phrasing at all. It, it, it's just I don't even really understand uh, why he didn't just say the truth straight up. Because I mean, maybe he's scared that criticizing the league is just going to get him more fines or something. But like, it was just I I don't know. Like you you know that Ben's going to end up on the injury report. He is. He was on the injury report today. He did not par- participate with that rib injury. So like. If you're trying to keep the injury on the down low, it's not going to stay on. I, I don't really under, uh, understand why he wouldn't just clear his name and say, "Yeah, <laughs> the, this is what happened. We don't, we didn't really know how injured he was. He was cleared, but we weren't uh, completely sure. So we just waited to pl- uh, play him until uh, it was absolutely necessary." Either way, it was a bizarre situation to be handled, and I, I'm glad like it's come to light this sense because I was I didn't want Tomlin fired but that that kind of decision where if it had been clear cut that's a fireable offense isn't it oh 100% if you were that arrogant and just saying yeah I'm not going to start my starting quarterback because this team is so bad uh that would that would have been a uh my first step to getting fired yeah that would be an all-time backfire but obviously that was not exactly what happened so I guess now let's talk about something Mike Tomlin really did butcher, and that was the clock management slash his faith with the Steelers' defense at the end of the game. So they had just given up a long touchdown drive, 
Ben Roethlisberger came, you know, came off the uh, off the pine from the injury, led a touchdown drive, and the Steelers had all the momentum. And how many times have we talked about this where the Steelers' defense cracked in big moments? They held on against Tampa Bay thanks to three turnovers. They didn't hold on against, or they held on against Baltimore, but I'm thinking about a lot of games. They gave up points to the Browns. They gave up points to the Bengals at the end, and they gave up they give up points to a lot of points to the Chargers. There's a lot of games where the Steelers' defense, it's been, a, would you not agree with me that it's been a bend but don't break defense for like three quarters and then it breaks in the fourth when it, you most need them to make a play? Oh, yeah. it's the, the defense actually usually plays pretty good for like three quarters of the game, like you said, and then they just break down because uh, in terms of yards given up, they're pretty good. They ran towards the top and both uh, rush defense and pass defense and that's because of how they play in, in like the beginning for the most part they just keep breaking down at, at the end I don't know if it's getting tired if it's getting lazy or or what's happening but they really just they can't play a full four quarters it seems like and it would help if they made plays but they haven't been but regardless they have struggled so much in these situations all year and with two timeouts and the clock running and the Raiders needing the Raiders appearing to be able to probably score at least uh i forget the exact situation they were up but they they were they had to score a touchdown so they were going to go for it regardless i don't understand why the steelers and mike tomlin didn't take timeouts there to save themselves some time and i know it worked out in the end but how often is that hook and ladder play going to work not using those timeouts i'd rather have like i'd rather have 55 seconds and no timeouts and 15 seconds and one timeout or two timeouts personally but that's just me my I, I'm not. Am I wrong to think that? No, I think that the uh, the time is is just you. You need as much time as you can, and also just want to build build off of that. Ryan Switzer running out that that uh, kick. I literally I lost my mind. I was I was at the because I believe that the Steelers had 28 seconds. They, they had 28 seconds before, uh, to to do something, and then what ends up happening is Ryan Switzer wastes. Oh, well, no, I'm sorry. They had 21 seconds. And uh, Ryan Switzer wasted uh, six seconds of that by running out the, for a kick return to get to the 30. Those five yards were not worth a six seconds. That, and that, that was just that. And that pissed me off. But now getting back to the, uh, the point at hand with how Mike uh, Tom should have handled that, yeah, it was would have been way better to have uh, more than fi- uh, 50 seconds and no timeouts compared to the 15 seconds. And I, I believe it was only one timeout. But it was just... It's just poor clock management that runs with uh, Tomlin. It's one of his huge, uh, like, downfalls. And when we talk about Tomlin, what he's not good at, he's always been bad at managing the clock. It's just, we, it's usually when something bad happens, when a bad loss occurs, we're talking about how uh, the clock was mismanaged. It's just something that goes with Tomlin. And <laughs> that would actually probably be the first step to getting fired. It's just that uh, the, the poor clock management that he has. And... You said we've seen this a lot before. I'd also like to point out that Switzer Switzer has done this in the past, too. I'm pretty sure he did this against the Bengals, too, where he ran the ball out, even though it didn't make sense for him to. All he had to do was let the ball bounce behind him, go for a touchback, and he would have saved time, but instead he returned it. Danny Smith needs to have Switzer understand that situation. You can't be losing valuable time there. When you consider... The fact that the Steelers only needed a field goal. Now, granted, this would be assuming you have a kicker that you're confident in. So I guess let's just assume that this is last year. You have to think all you need to do if you take a touchback is you only need to go 50 yards for not a gimme kick, but a kick you should have pretty good a pretty good chance to make. All you need to do is get to the opposing team's 25-yard line, and that's like a 42-yard field goal. So it's just it's not good when you don't not only not get back to there or even if you do get the five yards but when you lose six seconds I always think about that and like those types of situations when a quarterback will throw a flare route and it gets like two two to ten yards or something like that and it takes like ten seconds to run the play that's a win for the defense and I don't know uh Tomlin's been bad at clock management for so long. There was one particular game against the Chargers, actually, the last one in San Diego, 
where Mike Vick was starting. The Steelers took the kickoff, and the clock started running. And it worked out, because I'm sure you remember the Steelers won. Le'Veon Bell scored from one yard out at the gun. But the Steelers should have had 30 more seconds on that drive. Uh, do you remember that game at all? I do. I remember the Le'Veon Bell walk-off. I don't really remember the, the clock mismanagement uh, very much, but I do remember the Le'Veon Bell walk-off with no time left. So what happened was the Steelers run the kickoff back, and you know how the clock is supposed to stop in that situation? It didn't. The clock kept running. Like, the clock stopped, and then it, run, it ran again. The Steelers lost, like, 30, 40 seconds right there. Nobody seemed to notice it. And I don't get how you don't notice that. And it's a mistake to not criticize Tomlin and the Steelers for not noticing that because it, it worked out. Result, Results-based criticism, it, it shouldn't matter because it can cost you. And in this game, it did cost the Steelers. So that's why it's important to make sure you're critical of the clock management in all cases because even though it didn't cost them in that game against the Chargers, poor clock management cost the Steelers in this game. But yeah, go back and look at that, Austin, if you have the chance. It, it's really quite remarkable because it's amazing. Like, nobody seemed to know. I will, I'll have to check it out because I, 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 I remember watching that game. I remember the excitement from it. I don't remember that 30 seconds. Maybe I didn't even notice it when it happened. And uh, Tomlin's defense has struggled recently, and I guess it's technically Keith Butler's because Tomlin is more the overall head coach, but, you know, he's still a defensive guy. But Keith Butler's defense struggled again, and we've seen it all year. Terrible ball skills in the secondary. Uh, the coverage skills just not good on the second level. We've seen bad, you know, guys, linebackers not be put in positions to succeed, and we've seen just lack of talent up there too. So I guess just... Where are you right now with this defense? Well, the first thing coming out of this game is that uh, Bradley, the defensive backs coach, needs to have all the defensive backs on the jugs machine for like two hours straight because they all have like negative ball skills. Every single one of them uh, can't like track a ball for their life, and if it hits them in the hands, uh, they drop it. So in the cases where it does hit them in the hands, they need to catch it. Mike Hilton needs to come down with it. I love Mike Hilton. I'm going to criticize him so much because he should have had a pick. Sean Davis gets hit in the head, can't come up with that pick. They have no ball skills, so the freebies need to be come down with. And the way you fix freebies, just machine. You need, they need to do something. They need to work on catching or, or anything. Uh, I, was, I remember texting you about it, but even stupid stuff. Because uh, at this point... I'd be pissed if I'm the defensive backs coach that they've been given interceptions and they've dropped them or they shot themselves in the foot. And it's just, they could have, I mean, they weren't even making great plays, but the, the offense was just handing it to them. So I'm really making them do everything. I'm making them dip their hands in rice. Uh, and uh, if any of you guys uh, know, Michael Thomas of the Saints, the wide receiver, that's why he, he credits a lot of his. Good receiving ability. He currently leads the NFL in catch rate uh, in history. In, in history, not just this year. In history, uh, he does that for hours in a day. He, he just does small hand workouts and he puts his hands in rights because it softens your hands. I. They need to do anything. They need to do anything that's going to make their hands better to get those freebies. Because I know that they are not competitive at the catch. Uh, at the catch point, none of these defensive backs have ball skills. And that's going to have to be addressed in the draft. This is not something they can fix this year, unfortunately, in my opinion. I think that this is this is what the downfall of this team this year is. And that's, they're going to have to fix it next year. But what they can fix is how they catch. And it's just ridiculous. Now, going on to uh, another thing you said, the linebackers haven't been put in another position to succeed. And again, we saw it in this game, uh, and we saw right from the get-go, Jared Cook was immediately put on linebackers by himself. And granted, a tight end against a linebacker typically isn't a bad thing, but when Jared Cook is their best offensive weapon, and he's literally, like, you literally should have it circled on the paper that this guy is the guy you got to double cover, and they just leave the linebacker straight up on him. Like, it, it was just ridiculous. Like, he was uh, eating at first. Jared Cook slowed down towards the end. I, don't, I think he only had one catch in the second second half, but the first half he's absolutely destroying. And again, this is a lot of the Steelers not knowing how to take away a team's weakness. And that's always why 
this is why the Patriots are so good. The Patriots are they have never had like a really okay. I take that back. It's not never, but they don't really always have a top defense. And but what they've always been good at is forcing uh, teams to play to their weaknesses. They take away their one strong thing, and then they make them uh, try and beat them another way. And the Steelers just can't do that. The Steelers refuse, and it's Keith Butler's stubbornness. And it's going to get them fired after this year. If Keith Butler is here after this year, I think uh, I'm going to be. I'm, I think I'm about done with him. I, that's just how it is. But it's just. Keith Butler is just so stubborn. Like, you just keep seeing linebackers put on their best guys and not getting double covered. Like, who else is going to cover on, on the Raiders? I mean, at the end, because Morgan Burnett has negative ball skills, Seth Roberts got, uh, got them all the way down to, like, the five- or six-yard line that uh, set up – no, it was a three-yard line because Lee Smith got a three-yard touchdown. Uh, and it's just <sighs> – I was like, that's the only other guy that they, you had to worry about. Trudy Nelson got, like, two catches the entire day. Seth Roberts got that one big catch, and that was basically it. Like, they just uh, – Keith Butler's stubbornness is just aggravating to me because there, this is not something that can't be fixed. This is something that he's refusing to fix. It's just we're going to uh, put our guys in a position to fail and just hope it works. One, one of three times it'll work. But the other two out of three, it won't. But we're, we're going to commit to that anyway. Uh, and really, just one more thing to the defensive backs. Uh, one more thing to go back to the, them because I want to I want to talk about how how they're just not very good at coverage, and that's all the safeties. The safeties just I feel pretty happy with the corners. I won't lie to you, Mike Hilton, great game uh, this game. Should have had a pick six if he. Got that pick. Got his first sack this season. Happy with him. Joe Hayden, don't really have a problem with him this game. Cody Sensiball, uh, he is Cody Sensiball. So, like, there's going to be a few things that I'm, I'm pissed about. But you know what? Basic, compared to all, what Artie Burns is, I haven't been that mad at Cody Sensiball. Because Cody Sensiball has been decent. He's been um, not reliable, but he's just been I, – I, I don't know how to put it. He's just He's just been okay compared to – what Artie Burns would be if he was there. But the safeties, it's just like they went from averageness most of the year, and now they're just dying. Like they're, they're like every single one of them. Morgan Burnett is doing absolutely terrible when he's not injured. Uh, Sean Davis, the pet, uh, he was a, he won the award last week, the first award for the weaker than a uh, uh, weaker than aluminum foil player of the week. Like it, it was that bad. Terrell Edmonds had a really rocky start, and actually Terrell Edmonds might be our best safety right now. Like that. that that's how it is. Like it, it's just, and he's still not that good. But like he's he's just improved to where he's okay. And the other safeties are just that bad. Like Marcus Allen last week struggled too when he played. And I mean I can't harp on Jordan Dangerfield because he really only played a special team. But like, uh, it just seems like for a team that kept all these safeties going into this year that this this was this was a mistake. Like uh, I don't know I don't know. What do you have to say about the? the defense and how they performed in, in general, their skill. I'm less mad about Keith Butler this week than I was last week. Uh, quite simply because nobody worked. Let me ask you, uh, who are the, who are, how many guys did you see covering Jared Cook on Sunday? A, a lot of, uh, it was a lot of linebackers. It felt like, I felt like I saw Morgan Burnett and then Morgan Burnett was, I feel like the only defensive back I saw on him. Then uh, probably I think I saw John Bostic on him once. I saw Bud Dupree on him once. So I'll say I'll say three or four. I I could be wrong about Mike Hilton. I thought I saw him on him one time. I remember seeing a lot of Morgan Burnett. I remember seeing Bud Dupree. I remember seeing Bostic, L.J. Fort, and T.J. Watt. Um, none of those guys did their job. So I'm actually going to propose, at least in the middle of the field, that it's talent deficiency is playing a big part of it too. Now, I know that Butler really struggled and has struggled this year, but I'm starting to not necessarily back off of it per se, but I'm starting to put more blame on the players now too because none of them are doing their job. It's not the coach's fault necessarily if you're trying X amount of different guys and none of them are working. It's just they aren't good. And, I mean, the inside linebacker position just is a mess. Uh, Vince Williams is a B-minus player, in my opinion. 
and he thrived when he had a player like Ryan Chazier next to him. He's okay. He can play. But the problem is John Bostic is basically a run stopper, as we know. He can occasionally rush the passer, rush the passer, but he can't hold his own in pass coverage at all. Not against even unathletic tight ends like Jeff Hireman last week or two, three weeks ago now. And the problem with LJ Fort is he's a mess against the run. He can't get off blocks. He absolutely gets driven out of the hole. What do you do as a defense? What do you do as a defensive coordinator there? Like, what what do you do? Like, do you, do you see where I'm coming from? I do. I I I just I don't know. I, there's pro, there, there's blame I, to go I, on I both put, of them. Oh, sorry. You go ahead. I was just gonna say there's definitely blame on both. I'm not trying to make it seem like. Keith Butler deserves a, a pass here. We know that he deserves a lot of blame, but I mean, in this game, I'm starting to see more and more that I believe that there's just not enough talent. Yeah, so maybe maybe some of the blame comes off of Keith Butler and goes on to defensive draft scouts. Because, I mean, we look at, you gotta look back at past drafts, and like, it's not like the Steelers haven't, uh, haven't drafted defensive talent in the first few rounds. Obviously, uh, just not too long ago, Artie Burns, Sean Davis, Javon Hargrave were the first three picks uh, together. Terrell Edmonds was the first-round pick this past year. Bud Dupree was a first-round pick. Ryan Chazier all the way back then was a first-round pick. It's just, I, I mean, they busted on a lot of those. Like, Ryan Chazier wasn't a bust, but so maybe you, gotta do, you do got to take away from them. And Maybe uh, from uh, Kevin Colbert for not uh, addressing free agency as like strong as other teams for not getting these talented players. I mean, but I think uh, sorry to go off on a tangent here. I think that's actually going to change this year. The Steelers finally have cap space for once with uh, Le'Veon Bell, like a big portion, because they also cleared out some cap space earlier this year. So they should have like 19 million uh, with, uh, especially with uh, cap going up too. So they might actually finally change how they uh, adjust things and actually get a good player that they don't have to take a gamble on the draft D and instead get a free agent. But well, why I, still, don't we, why don't we I still struggle to take away a lot of the blame on, on Keith Butler because I do think that this defense has shown some – they flash talent and they don't – they just – they're not consistent with it. I don't – I don't understand. Like the Panthers game, that was talent. There's a lot of talent uh, on the defensive side in that game, I felt. I mean, you're still su- sucking against running backs, uh, like Christian McCaffrey out of the backfield and stuff, but there was, there was still just, I don't know. I, I, re- I really, I, 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 I could take some of the blame off Butler because of what you said because you make a good point, but like I still put a lot of blame on him. Well, why don't we transition now to just, like, let's talk about the defense going forward. Why don't we look at, like, the starters, and obviously let's talk about, you know, like, uh, Keith Butler. So, Butler at the end of the year, I think he's gone. Um, I think there's a chance he stays if the Steelers somehow win these next two games, but I think these next two games could put the nail in the coffin for him. I think he is out as defensive coordinator after this year. I think that's fair, yeah, because if they lose these next two games, uh, we're going to start hearing about Mike Hilton, uh, Mike Hilton, Mike Tomlin being on that the hot seat because it's it's not going to be pretty. All right, let's look at the defensive front. Hayward Hargrave to it. These this is the position group I'm the most happy with. I feel like there really aren't problems. If you want, you can address the depth of the position a little bit, but there's nothing really. I feel like you need to add besides like a, a secondary free agent maybe. Yeah, the biggest problem is Cameron Hayward, who hasn't. Uh, he came off his probably a career year last year, just hasn't performed like that. But Stephon Tuitt, uh, after like the first four games of the season, came back and is absolute playing like an absolute beast. Javon Hargrave, now second on the team in sacks, playing out of his mind. Uh, I mean, I gotta agree with you. Like you, can, and it's not like you're gonna replace Cameron Hayward just because he has one down year, or like has a few down years. Because he's still uh, he's still playing pretty uh decent he had six tackles in this past game for all of them by himself so i i it's just uh i wouldn't even say that hayward's having that bad of a year I, I i think it's fair to say he kind of had maybe maybe overachieved isn't the right word but he had a, kind of padded his stats a bit his career high at any other year of his career is seven and a half so he's only a sack and a half off that so this is actually much closer to what we're used to with him 
And as far as tackles go, he he typically has a the highest he's ever had is 59. He usually is right around 15. And he's at 42 right now. So it's not like he's playing bad per se. He had a bad stretch. I'll agree with you certainly from there, but I don't even think he's playing. I think he's playing much more in line with what his career average is like, and he's still a good player as we know. So I think, I think up front, the starters are no issue at all. Yeah. I think I, you really can't make an argument for uh, replacing any of them. And then the outside linebackers look, uh, TJ Watt is the only thing you can say about TJ Watt is is he's inconsistent and he's not an elite pass rusher, but I think he does just about everything else well. Yeah, he's uh he's above average in coverage, I feel like, for an outside linebacker, which I mean isn't the best thing you want out of an outside linebacker, but I mean he's still formidable. I feel like he he's I feel like he's a decent player still and I I can't make a case to replace him. I think he's a I think he's a good player and I, I I want a player like that on my team. The problem is you want the other side to be an elite pass rusher and Bud Dupree hasn't done that. Would I think you can call Bud Dupree a serviceable player. I, I think stopgap is maybe a little disrespectful, but he's not elite in, at really anything. But I mean it's not like he's he's not a backup either, like Jarvis Jones was. Uh that's funny you said that. I was literally thinking I was like, Yeah, Bud Dupree isn't a Jarvis Jones. So when his contract ex- expires for the Steelers, I think another team is gonna come and take him because uh, of his speed, but like He's just a, he's another player that the Steelers uh, took that they wanted to work around his speed and develop him, and he's just not like he's like you said he's serviceable, but he's not not elite in any of uh, like any like football skills. You know what I'm saying? Like he's just got that speed, and like he could get the sacks with like delays and and different kind of blitzes, but like normally he's just not that good of a pass rusher without those special plays like for him to get in there. Yeah, like he needs to either get schemed or jump the jump it really well. And then behind him, you have, you know, Chicolo and Ola Adani. And Adani, I have high hopes for, but do you really want to not address that position at all and just hope, okay, uh, you know, we're going to rely on Chicolo and an undrafted free agent from last year who who's played and who'll play in like five games this year. You see what I'm saying? I still think they have to address outside linebackers at some point in this draft. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely something because this this defense with a really good pass rushing outside linebacker could be insane. I mean, the Steelers right now uh, lead the league in sacks, but imagine what they could do by adding one more uh, uh, an elite pass rusher in either free agency or the draft. Like it would be insane. And uh, uh, like you said, uh, you, you you can't really put all your uh, marbles and money on a Danny, and then definitely not on Chicola. So they're probably going to have to add someone at least for depth, especially with uh, Bud Dupree not having that much longer on his contract. And not uh, not Keon Adams either. But, yeah, Dupree will be back uh, for his uh, fifth-year option year, but uh, I would hope the Steelers restructure it a bit because he's too expensive at that price. But uh, inside linebacker, Vince Williams is obviously there. I think everyone else is pretty much fair game. I think you can keep Fort. Uh I think this is it for John Bostic. He just you can't justify putting him on the field with Vince Williams, and we talked about that like before the year too. Yeah, they're just they're, they're like the same type of player. Like uh, Shazier, like you said, Shazier and Williams complement each other because Shazier was a playmaker and Williams was more of a the run stopper, and he just kind of got the tackles a lot. I mean, Shazier got a lot of tackles too. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I just feel like John Bostic and Vince Williams don't complement each other. It's just like it's like magnets when you have two of the same the same magnet they just repel each other they don't help they don't uh they don't make each other better just uh, that's how i feel about it i feel like you need i would rather have lj fort starting even if he's technically the worst player in uh run stopping because lj fort just faster he, he fits that position better he's he's like shazier more yeah and then even even then like medikevich we know is basically a special teams player in Fort, although I think he's a good player in pass coverage. He's really fast. He's clearly got his flaws, and his flaws have hurt this team too. So it's not like there's a reason he's a backup. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's his run stopping. He's, he, he's not very good against the run. So you need to address inside linebacker again, as we've been saying for two years. There has to be something you can do. I'm hoping they do something there. And then in the secondary – 
look, we talked about it. You, you can look at it anywhere. I, I, I don't know if you go safety. I think you probably go at cornerback, but I don't know what you do here. I, I, I mean, you keep Artie Burns the next year simply because he's cheap, but, uh, I mean, you're bringing, you have to bring back uh, Joe Hayden. I mean, you have to bring him back. He's the only guy who's worth anything right now. You'll have Mike Hilton, uh, Cam Sutton, I don't know. Uh, I, th- I think maybe you add a safety. You, you have to add some sort of ball hawking defensive back. And I, I actually kind of hope it's a free agent, but not the Morgan Burnett. Morgan Burnett's gone. He's He has not worked out. Oh, not at all. It seemed like such a good deal when it happened. It seemed so cheap and like it was going to be great, but just not at all. And like, you just kind of think back and, and think about how the Steelers uh, could have had the Honey Badger because a lot of people be- uh, begged for him. And I mean, at first... Uh, and re- everything looks better in retrospect. And afterwards, I was like, yeah, no, they got a better deal with Morgan Burnett. Now I just look at what um, what he, he's doing, uh, Tyron uh, Matthew, and it's just like if the Steelers had him for like two more minutes, because they saved money on Le'Veon Bell, they could have. This team would likely be, <laughs> they would have their one star on defense at the ball hawk, because Tyron Matthew is, is an exceptional player. And, I mean, this uh, everyone, everyone was worried about him getting hurt, and so far he hasn't been hurt for the Texans. He's been playing out of his mind. So you just kind of look at that, and you kind of just your feelings get hurt a little bit because, in retrospect, they should have just paid the like extra two million more for him and just uh, sucked it up. But because they had the room too, because we, we we talked about it. we thought they were going to make a move right before the the season started because they cleared like six million in cash space a lot with Vance McDonald and Cameron Hayward reconstructors. So you're telling me they couldn't uh, make the extra two million for Tyron Matthew? That would be uh, that would be BS, is, is what that would be. But uh, what they need to add, though, uh, as a whole, like I'm looking at a few players. There's a few players that are free agents and that are question marks. Number one for me, I'm looking at Quan Alexander. Quan Alexander contract year just tore his ACL, which is unfortunate, but. Uh, I would still take the risk on him because he's just he's such a uh, a playmaker and he's so good. But also quarterback wise, Ronald Darby also tore his ACL, so also a little bit of a question mark and and sort of a, a risk because because of that ACL injury. But uh, he's a top corner. I believe he's actually unfortunately one of the best ones in free agency this year. I haven't. I, I remember looking. I was I was kind of disappointed for that, but he's just really. Uh, he's one of the top ones that the Steelers can go after, uh, and he's pretty good. He's a, uh, he's a playmaker as well. He's not exactly the best in coverage, but does make a few a pl- uh, few plays. But uh, regardless, I think we learned with Sean Davis that safety needs to be addressed. And I mean, this was like the last year that they could say, "All right, let's give let's give um, Sean Davis one more year." And and now it's like, I think we can improve. It's just it's just better if they go after someone and you know it really hurts uh thinking of it uh thinking of how the Steelers could have went for like Tyron Matthew I really if the Steelers were committed to winning this year I think they're really sort of strongly committed to trying to get Patrick Peterson I know I I know it's like tiring to hear that and like it's like it never would have happened because the Cardinals would have but I think they should have made him a deal that they uh couldn't refuse because I just saw a stat the other day that uh Patrick Peterson hasn't allowed more than 80 yards in, oh my gosh, it's it's something ridiculous. I think it's since 2014. He hasn't allowed more than 80 yards in a game. Just, he's insane, but uh, they got to find something. (laughs) That's the thing. They need a, they need another, they need something over there, especially with, uh, and they, I hope they extend Joe Hayden because if they don't, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. But uh, just, I think we could both agree something needs to be added to the secondary. This can't be like last year where we're like, all right, you need to draft an inside linebacker, and the Steelers just decide, you know what, let's skip it, and, and not. They need to add a corner or, sa- or a safety. It's just I w- ideally both in like the first and second round if there's no good edge guy, but uh, they need to at least get one of them. Okay, so let me get this straight. Needs are as follows. Depth outside linebacker. Inside linebacker, starter. Inside linebacker, depth. Uh, Cornerback, starting cornerback. Cornerback, depth. Starting safety, depth, safety. Uh, You don't do that in an (laughs) offseason. This is going to take drafting and free agency. So I guess 
at the end of the day, the only thing I think, ideally you see the Steelers spend a first-round pick on either inside linebacker or safe or defensive back and then take the the other take a high profile free agent right yeah i think you gotta, you gotta do it that way whichever one you don't draft in the first round you either just uh in the free agency which is unfortunate because you're gonna have to do it in free agency first most likely whereas the draft if you maybe you get a, a high level cornerback but then there aren't any inside linebackers like there were this past year, and it's like, well, what do you do now, right? Oh, yeah. It's going to be interesting. You know who's an interesting free agent cornerback uh, after this year? is Kareem Jackson. He's older. He's he's 31. But, I mean, he's been playing out of it. He's having a career year this year, so, I mean, he might be an interesting one to go, go for. But, like, a lot of these other guys, like, there's some – there's some not good players that are going to be uh, uh, on the market soon. I mean, you also got to think about your replacement because Cody Sensible is on a contract year as well. So, like, Cody Sensible is gone after, after this season. So they're going to have to really – they're going to have to uh, replace with quite a few positions. I mean, maybe Justin Bethel you pursue, maybe Bradley Roby. There's some other names. But it seems more and more like they're going to draft a cornerback because all these quarterbacks don't look very good, so to say. Oh, man. So I guess now there's the only thing we really need to discuss now at this point, besides kind of the team as a whole, is Chris Boswell. Uh, He's missed six of his 16 field goal attempts this year. He's missed, what, five point after, six point after attempts? How many is it? I think it's at six. He's missed six. You know, he his points have cost the Steelers. The Steelers would have won, probably win two weeks ago. They win this week with the points he left on the board. He's hurting this football team. And where the last few years he bailed out this team so many times, he looks lost out there. And he's clear, you know, you feel bad for the kid because he, he wants nothing more than to win. It's not like this, it's not like he got his money and cashed out. That's not who he is. But at the same time, He's not getting it done. The Steelers brought in two kickers today, Kai Forbath, and what was the other guy's name? Um, McCrane. McCrane, uh, that's right. Uh, Nobody was signed, but the Steelers have clearly started to move in another direction. We had talked about this, Austin, possibly doing something unconventional because it's really hard to eat Chris Boswell's contract since you just signed him to it this year uh, about carrying maybe two kickers this year, but it looks like the Steelers aren't going to do it right now. What do you do from here, I guess? What are your thoughts on Chris Boswell and whether or not he could ever snap out of it, just how he's been this year and what the Steelers should do? Well, my thoughts on Chris Boswell was I was pissed. After seeing that second kick, I I lost my mind. Don't be stupid like me. I mean, I'm not typically an angry person, but (laughs) after that kick, I texted John. I was like, I think I broke my head. Because uh, there's a nice hole in my wall, and then there's a nice, like, dent in my door because it was open. If it was closed, there would be a hole. But don't be stupid like me. Don't punch things because you're angry. Regardless, um, yeah, Boswell, I, I'm always done. I mean, I've been done for a while, and I mean, it, it, sometimes every, every once in a while a hot take is going to hit. And my hot take, like, I don't remember when I said it. But I was like, I think that the Steelers need to move on from Boswell like five weeks ago. And if they do that, they have two, probably two more wins uh, because of it. So one of my hot takes actually hit home. And, and that's what I think at this point. Like, if, if the Steelers the Steelers are not signing a kicker today, I mean, maybe they'll do it later in the week. But uh, I, I was going to say it if we didn't see any kickers brought in. The Steelers not signing a kicker are committing to losing. That's what they're telling me. They're committing to putting a guy out on the field that uh, is literally leaving points out there. Five, uh, uh, a year away originally, by the way, it was five missed extra points. Uh, and just the six missed field goals, just absolutely, absolutely terrible. Like, it's, uh, if you're, you're keeping it out there, it's literally committing to losing. It's, it's just, and the Steelers should roster two uh, kickers because other teams have done it this year. Uh, the Steelers won't be the first time. I mean, the Steelers would be doing it for a different reason, but the Falcons have uh, rostered a kicker for, like, most of the year, it feels like, two of them, because 
Matt Bryant's been hurt, and they had uh, Tavecchio, Tavecchio, uh, the Raiders' old kicker. But um, they've been rostering two kickers. The Chargers have rostered two kickers this year. The uh, Raiders have rostered two kickers this year. Uh, at some point, it's just the Steelers need to do it if they want. To, if they really are committed to winning this year, if they're going to try and beat the Saints and beat the Patriots, now it was it was time to move on from Boswell. And I'm not saying cut him, just bench him. And uh, one of the best things I saw was on Twitter is saying, say he came up with a phantom leg injury and put him on IR and bring him back to camp next year to see if he fixes stuff. And that, that, would, that would probably be the best case scenario. So you don't even have to roster two kickers technically. One goes on IR and one, uh, one just replaces Chris Boswell. So I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm super done with Chris Boswell. I'm not a very happy uh, person thinking about it. Make sure you... Uh, really upset, but it's just it is what it is. Like it, it, it's a time you you see he's struggling. He's not bouncing back. There is no time to bounce back. We have three more games to play. Like three more games uh, in the regular season to play, and that's. I mean, if you make the playoffs, like you maybe you got four because you're a one and done team, but you're committing. I keep saying, but you're committing to losing by keeping Chris Boswell. That's 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 what that says to me because. Oh, yeah, he's messed up all year this year, but we're still going to keep him because he costs us a lot of money. Okay, like, I, it, just, it pisses me off a lot. What do you think? I think he, there's no way he plays out of it this year. Unfortunately, you can't place him on IR with a phantom injury. He has to actually be injured for that to happen. It could be, like, a calf strain or something, and then you could do it, but... Uh, realistically, the only the best option in my mind is to, at the very least, there, there's no no way this gets solved without him sitting. He's had time to play through this, play through his woes, and he hasn't. You have to sign someone else, cut you know Zach Banner or somebody, and you have to bench Boswell, have the other kicker play at least this next week. Hopefully he plays well, and if he plays well enough, you just keep this new kicker in. Or, you know, he plays, whatever happens, happens, and you give Boswell a chance next week. There are a lot of times I've seen where, like, you just give a guy a week off, like, let him reset, and it helps. Now, granted, football is a little different than these other sports, but, is it, like, you have to at least give him some time off here. I don't think there's any situation where he he breaks out of it now. Not this year, anyways. At this point, I honestly think uh, the, the Steelers should return to how they were like three years ago or four years ago now, where they just went for two, like a ridiculous amount of times. Because why not? I mean, you, five times this year, the uh, Steelers have ended up with one less point than they should have in a touchdown. I mean, and that's on like 16 attempts. So looking at it, the, the Steelers would have to go for 11 for 16 on two point attempts for it to be like the same amount. But I mean, also there's a bigger payoff when you get, when you hit the two points. So uh, if that makes sense, like, I feel like it's just at this time, it's more worth it. Like wh- why not just go for two on every uh, PAT when you're uh, on like fourth and three at, at the, uh, at the opponent's like uh, 30, why not go for it? Cause I mean, you have a better chance of, I mean, if you're going to flip the field, flip the field. I mean, that's what would have happened if uh, Boswell would have missed the field goal anyway. Like this is how I feel right now. Like if they're go- if they're going to keep Boswell as the starter, like I want them to start doing these ridiculous things that they shouldn't have to do because they they had Boswell there. Like he shouldn't. Be- I I don't want him kicking kicks unless it's like fourth and eight and they're at like the twenty. Like where it's like it would be uh, stupid to not not kick it. Like I don't know. I'm just. Uh, I, I think that keeping Chris Boswell is a mistake uh, as a starter. I mean, it's it's an unfortunate situation. I don't, I can't think of a way. I don't know. It, it really is. Uh, again, I, I I preached this at the beginning of the year when he got signed that you don't sign kickers to multi year deals. To a two year deal is about the most I do. Maybe maybe three, but still. You know, when we were t- Chris Boswell was a Pro Bowl kicker last year, and now he's on the fringes of being cut, and you know it it changes just like that. Uh, I had a thought and I forgot about it. Oh, 
I wish I remembered what it was. I'll think about it later, but I, I guess just on the whole, does this do, do the Steelers make the playoffs? The whole, um, so I was a pessimist at the start of the year, felt better in the middle, and now what are we back to? I think I'm back to being a pessimist because realistically, I don't think the Steelers beat the Patriots. Funny enough, I think they could beat the Saints. The Saints are trending downwards really hard right now. I don't know what their offense is just struggling. Like, they struggled against the Cowboys. They just struggled against the um, Buccaneers, which is absolutely terrible. I mean, they ended up winning that game, but, like, the offense was, like, missing for three quarters. And then uh, then, (laughs) Drew uh, had a costly fumble, and it's just like they, they weren't working together. So the Saints are in a little game to me right now because the Saints are just not... They're they're falling apart a little bit towards the end. I mean, they could always reel it back, but I just looking at it. Well, I'll say the beat the Saints and the Bengals, and I guess my answer is, is going to be yeah. I think that they can make it as the six wild card team because I think they're going to lose the division to the Ravens. I think the Ravens are going to win out. I think the Steelers are just are going to either. Just beat the Bengals, which is not not a a gimme. It's just it's the most likely game I could see. And then they, I think they're gonna win one. They're gonna, I'll put it that way. They'll win one against the Saints or the Patriots, and that's just gonna be enough to get them the sixth seed behind the uh, the Chargers. But it's not looking good. What do you think? All right. Before I answer that, I forget exactly how many, but Boswell's missed what uh, eleven kicks in total between PATs and field goals. I forget the exact number, but I think it's something like eight of those misses have come with the Steelers either trailing by a score or tied. And that's terrible. <laughs> like that, that's, that's a difference maker. That, that, that's how you lose the games on such a minor position. Yeah, that, that just makes matters worse. So, and basically... All you have to do is never be tied or never be trailing. So there you go. Problem solved, right? There you go. But, yeah, uh, I don't know. I feel better about the Steelers' chances this week. It's weird. The Steelers were were so close to beating the Patriots last year. And I know we say this every year, but I feel like the Patriots are worse than they have been the past two years. But the, it's so, it's hard for me to say the Steelers are going to beat them when they haven't since 2011. And the, the, the funny thing is the Patriots are worse off, but are the Steelers not far worse off than they were last year? Uh, uh, yeah. No, the Steelers are definitely worse off than they were last year, I feel like. You could probably make the argument the Steelers overachieved in the 2017 regular season and they're underachieving this year. Yep. All things said, though, they'll have a chance to beat both teams, I guess is what I'm trying to say. They should, and I believe they will beat the Bengals. I'm not saying it's guaranteed because, you know, nothing is anymore. But I'm going to agree with you. I think they win one of the two games this, these next two weeks, and I think it's actually going to be this game against New England. The Steelers went 0 for 4 against the AFC East this year. Against the... AFC East. Who? The AFC... Uh, or, AFC. sorry, the West. The West, I'm sorry, my bad. The AFC West, silly me. Uh, so I, was, I, was like, I, I was like, wait, <laughs> we didn't play the AFC East. Yeah, no, no one, the Chiefs beat us, the Broncos beat us, the Chargers beat us, and then the Raiders. Fun time. So the Steelers dropped to 7-5-1, and one, and I guess that really just about does it, right? Yep, that basically does it. One last uh, bit of news to report. Uh, the Saints released... Wide receiver Brandon Marshall, who had played 178 career regular season games uh, without having been in a playoff game, uh, that streak is either going to continue or he's going to retire. Uh, it looks like he was going to be with the Saints until then, uh, but they never activated him. So uh, Brandon Marshall, free agent again. Sucks for him. Yeah, it really does. Really unfortunate. In his prime, he was a really good player. But alas... Uh, Alas, he is left to find a new team. That'll wrap up this special uh, edition of uh, the Stronger Than Steel podcast. Kind of uh, off script here. We uh, we hope you enjoyed it, and we thank you as always for listening. 
We'll be back shortly to preview Steelers Patriots again week 15, just like last year. Uh, you know, we're hoping for a lot better results, but time will tell and uh, we will be back shortly. So thank you as always for joining me, Austin. Thank you as always for listening to the stronger than steel podcast. Wait, I got one more thing for you. Okay. Yeah. Thursday night football. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. at Chiefs. Spread is three and a half points. I'll, I'll give you time to think about it because I've been thinking about it for a little bit. Uh, the Chiefs are only third by three and a half. I'm taking them to cover. I think that Chiefs are going to run away with this game. No Austin Eckler, no Melvin Gordon for the, uh, uh, for the Chargers, and I think that the Chiefs run away with this one. So what do you think? I completely agree with you. I believe the Chargers have beaten the Chiefs just once in their past eight or nine games. That continues here. All right, that's all. That's all I wanted to say. Oh, and uh, the Vikings offensive coordinator John De, De Filippo from De Filippo. Uh, the Eagles uh, last year got fired as well after a poor performance on uh, Monday Night Football from this, the the Vikings. Kirk Cousins worth eighty four million dollars. Glad we don't have to talk about that every week because that would be a weekly discussion on this show. Oh, 100 percent. Oh, I'm so glad that that that's not an issue. all right uh as always thank you for listening to the stronger than steel podcast have a great night have a good night you have been listening to stronger than steel podcast thank you for joining us today and don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below